Hi, I'm Dr. Daniel Fleming. I have a practice that's virtually exclusively in breast augmentation surgery. I've performed the procedure more than 3,000 times. And over the years, I've used smooth and textured anatomical high cohesive gel implants and also Silamed's polyurethane foam covered cohesive gel implants. I've used the foam covered implants for about five years and for the last uh, 12 to 18 months I've used them exclusively in my patients and I think that's been a great benefit to my patients and indeed to me. The purpose of this video is to explain to you how, what led me to that decision and give you up-to-date information about where polyurethane foam covered breast implants fit in 21st century breast augmentation. It's important, I think, to realise that polyurethane foam-covered breast implants are not new. We remember that uh, the first silicone implants came along in about 1964, and the first polyurethane foam implant was actually implanted in 1968, only four years later. And it was another 16 years before textured implants came onto the scene. So the concept of polyurethane foam implants is not new, they've been around a long time, and that means we've got a lot of in vivo experience that uh, allows us to make judgments about how safe they are in human beings. Silamed, which is based in Rio de Janeiro, has been making polyurethane foam implants since 1983. So what are they? They're a smooth surfaced cohesive gel silicone breast implant covered with a layer of polyurethane foam. And unlike the early polyurethane foam implants, this uh, polyurethane foam layer is vulcanized to the surface of the implant rather than simply glued. And this prevents early delamination, which was certainly a problem uh, in the very early uh, polyurethane foam covered implants made by other companies. Polyurethane foam covered silicone gel implants have definite advantages. They certainly reduce capsular contracture dramatically. They reduce the incidence of bottoming out or downward displacement. They never rotate. And the only extra risk in their use, compared with the other kind of implants that are available, is a temporary rash in about 1-2% to of patients, which occurs in the second week after surgery, and is itchy, a nuisance, doesn't make people ill, doesn't uh, come back, and doesn't have any long-term implications. The other important thing about polyurethane foam-covered silicone gel breast implants is that they have a 40-year safety history. There's more than 100 peer-reviewed papers been published about them, and we're going to look at some of that evidence today. Let's consider capsular contracture. We all know that capsular contracture is the commonest complication of breast augmentation surgery. It's a real nuisance for patients and doctors alike. Now, how common is um, capsular contracture? Well, it's probably more common than we like to admit. We know that the studies refer to capsular contracture rates. They're referring to grade three and four capsular contracture, of course. Uh, the best data we have, I think, is from the pre-marketing approval studies which were submitted to the Food and Drug Administration in the USA in 2006. Both Mentor and Inamed, which has now, of course, become Allergan, submitted their data for capsular contracture rates on silicone gel implants, both smooth and textured. The crucial importance of this data was confirmed by one of the world's leading authorities in breast augmentation, Professor Scott Spear. He wrote in PRS, the information that plastic surgeons would be most interested in would be that regarding single lumen textured and smooth silicone gel implants. The very best data regarding those devices are available from the core clinical studies that were submitted to the Food and Drug Administration over the last year as part of the pre-market approval process by both Inamed and Mentor. The results were that uh, Mentor had uh, 8% at three years and Allergan, or Inamed as it was then, had 9% at four years. And we also know that capsular contracture can happen after that, and so the figure of one in 10, at least one in 10 patients having a problematical capsular contracture is the reality. I made this prediction about increasing capsular contracture rates over time in May 2009. As we will now see, the core study data has in fact showed that I significantly underestimated the ongoing cumulative incidence of capsular contracture for both smooth and textured silicone gel implants. To properly understand the complication of capsular contracture, we need to realise that capsular contracture rates increase over time. In the FDA supervised core studies, the approved statistical method for measuring capsular contracture was Kaplan-Meier survival analysis. Neil Handel, in PRS in 2006, published his long-term study of outcomes and complications with breast implants. This showed that curves from Kaplan-Meier survival analysis revealed that capsular contracture is a progressive phenomenon, and the longer any group of patients is followed, the greater the cumulative risk of developing contracture. 
And this contradicts the widely held belief that if patients remain contracture-free for a year or two, they will probably not develop significant contracture. This is exactly what has happened in the core studies. In 2008, Allergan's primary breast augmentation cohort had had their implants for eight years. And the grade three and four capsular contracture rate for both textured and smooth implants was 16.8%. There can be no doubt that it will increase further as time progresses. Contrast this with a large, long-term prospective study of Silamed polyurethane foam-covered primary breast augmentation patients, which showed by 15 years a capsular contracture rate of 1%. Many of you, of course, will be familiar with the fact that polyurethane foam implants do reduce capsular contraction. Now, to understand why that occurs, we need to really understand what happens when capsular contraction occurs. First of all, it's necessary to look at the histology of a capsule. This is a picture of the histology of a smooth wall implant capsule. And what I want you to see is that it mainly consists of collagen. And I want you to notice that the collagen fibers are all lined up end on end. They're longitudinally arranged. Now what this means is that if a stimulus to capsular contracture comes along, and there are many of those, we don't know what all the causes of capsular contracture are, but we do know it's multifactorial. If a stimulus to contract comes along, those collagen fibers can slide over one another in a longitudinal fashion. And that has the effect of shrinking the capsule, like shrink wrap, around the implant concentrically, contracting it, making it feel firm, hard, or making it go out of shape. Now let's have a look at a capsule from a textured implant. We've stained the collagen pink on this occasion, but we can see that the architecture is fundamentally the same. Those collagen fibrils are still lined up end on end, and that's why there probably isn't much difference between capsular contracture rates with smooth and textured implants. Yes, there is the Barnsley study which showed a small but significant difference in capsular contracture rates with textured implants in favour of textured implants, but that was only in front of the muscle. There was no difference behind the muscle, and equally there are many studies which show that in fact there's no difference whether it's in front or behind the muscle with smooth and textured implants. And certainly my own experience, having used a lot of textured and a lot of smooth, I didn't find an appreciable difference in capsular contracture rates between the two types. This has been borne out again by the pre-marketing approval studies, which have shown no difference in capsular contracture rates between smooth and textured implants. Now let's look what happens when we use a polyurethane foam-covered implant. This is a picture of an unused polyurethane foam-covered implant, and if we blow up the foam, we can see what the structure of the foam is, and we'll look at it now uh, heavily enlarged. This is an electron microscopy photograph of the unused foam, and we can see that it's a lattice or a meshwork of, of foam. Now, it's important to understand that the fundamental difference between uh, other kinds of implants and this kind of implants is that the foam becomes incorporated into the fibrous capsule. Here is a series of photographs which shows a, an implant, a polyurethane foam implant before it's been implanted and one that's been removed after at least three months. It takes about that long for the foam to become incorporated into the capsule. And what we can see as we enlarge this is we can just see an imprint of where the foam was on the surface of the implant. So the implant after a period of time looks like a moderately textured implant. But it's important to understand that in the body, the foam is still in contact with that implant surface. In order to remove those implants, it's a Velcro effect. Uh, and so there is continuity between the implant shell and the foam which has become part of the capsule. When we're comparing polyurethane foam implants to textured implants, it's interesting to consider about how the textured implants work and whether they really do work and get a Velcro effect. And I'd like you to think about in your own practice experience the number of times when you've removed textured implants. How many times have there, has there been a strong Velcro effect between the textured implant and the capsule? I know from my own personal experience that when I'm removing textured implants, in the vast majority of cases, there is no adherence and the implant has actually behaved like a smooth implant. Here's an example of a teardrop textured implant which had rotated, and we can see that there was no adherence between the capsule and the implant, and it just has behaving like a smooth implant. And in those circumstances, there is obviously a higher risk of rotation. The benefit with the polyurethane foam is not only do they adhere through the high friction coefficient immediately as you put them in, so you don't need to stabilize the implant immediately afterwards, you don't need any special bras or straps, but they always develop tissue ingrowth, they always develop a Velcro effect, and this is why rotation doesn't occur. 
So now, if we take a slide of the polyurethane foam capsule, it looks like this. Completely different to the architecture of the smooth surface capsule and the textured surface capsule. Now, in this, in this photograph, the collagen has been stained blue. And just to orientate you, the little diamond-shaped uh, yellow structures there are in fact part of the, of the foam matrix. What we've done is we've taken a slide out of the foam, out of the capsule, including the foam matrix, and we're looking down on it. And so they're not pieces, they're not fragments of uh, polyurethane foam. It's part of an integrated structure. We've just taken a slide. Now, the importance of that polyurethane foam matrix is that the collagen fibers will wrap around each individual strut of that foam matrix in 3D. This is important because it breaks up the longitudinal arrangement of the collagen fibers. If you like, microcapsules are formed around each individual strut in 3D. Now, if a stimulus to contract comes along, I'm sure the collagen still does contract, but it contracts in the microcapsules around the strut in the 3D architecture that is spread out over the whole implant. We don't get the longitudinal sliding of the collagen fibers, and we don't get the shrink wrap effect of the capsule shutting down concentrically and squashing the implant. This is why capsular contracture is dramatically reduced with polyurethane foam implants compared with both smooth and textured implants. This is entirely consistent with Neil Handel's findings that capsular contracture risks increased over time. Because the risk of capsular contracture increases over time, Handel noted, it seems less likely that it is related to acute events such as bacterial contamination, surgical technique, drains, antibiotics or other ancillary measures that have a short-term impact and more likely related to some chronic effect of implants on adjacent tissue. Polyurethane foam-covered implants mediate this chronic effect on adjacent tissue and provide a stable marriage between the implant and the capsule. Once we've implanted a polyurethane foam implant into patients, there's quite a strong inflammatory response as the body reacts to that polyurethane foam and removes it from the surface of the implant as the capsule is forming. There's marked inflammatory cell infiltration with macrophages, giant multinuclear cells, and they form these microcapsules micro around the collagen struts which become collagenized. This capsule that's formed is actually a thicker but spongy capsule. It's soft, uh, and this, of course, adds to the uh, beneficial effects uh, cosmetically for our patients. You will recall that we mentioned in the evolution of implant technology that foam predated texturing. In the late 1980s, polyurethane foam had a very significant part of the United States market, perhaps 20 to 30 percent, uh, and manufacturers developed texturing as a response. Here is electron micrographs of unused foam and of a biocell implant. And you can see that the structure superficially is the same. Uh, and that's why uh, it was thought that the texturing would replicate the uh, effect of the polyurethane foam. But of course, the texturing always remains on the surface of the implant. So at best, it can only affect those fibers that are right at the surface of the implant, on the implant surface. It cannot affect the full thickness of the capsule wall, which is seen to be necessary to get the big reduction in capsular contracture rates. We're all aware that there have been criticisms of polyurethane foam implants. Uh, most of these criticisms have, in fact, over time shown to be misplaced, and it's important that we spend some time going through that so that you can become aware of what the actual evidence shows. Cancer, of course, was the, was the worry, and we've all heard that the polyurethane foam can break down into substances that may cause cancer in patients. This is not true. It is absolutely not true. I'm going to show you now how that information is not true, was never true, how it came into being, and you will have a complete understanding. First of all, polyurethane foam has never been shown to be carcinogenic in any species, including the cancer-prone rat model. Polyurethane foam has been approved in breast implants for unrestricted use in Europe, in Australia, and many other jurisdictions. The Health Protection Branch in Canada has stated that women polyurethane foam implants have no raised increased risk of cancer. And even the FDA in 1995 said there was no significant risk. Let's examine then uh, in some detail how this came into being. Polyurethane foam is made from a polymerization of 2,4 and 2,6 toluene diisocyanate. And the early studies showed the presence of very low concentrations of a breakdown product called 2,4-toluene diamine, 2,4-TDA. It was found in the urine of some patients in very low quantities, but interestingly and very significantly, it was never found in their blood. Now, 2,4-TDA was known to be a carcinogen in high doses in rodents, although not in humans. 
2,4 TDA has never been shown to cause cancer in humans and there are two epidemiological studies which show that uh, exposure to high doses of 2,4 TDA in industry, in industrial uh, applications, uh, cause no increase of cancer of any kind in human beings. It's important to understand that in fact 2,4 TDA is not a significant breakdown of polyurethane foam covered in plants. In vivo, polyurethane foam is broken down slowly over many years by inflammatory cell esterases. And we can see this uh, when we look at the polyurethane foam electron micrographs of the unused foam and of the foam after six years. The struts are slightly thinner because they are being broken down. Now what happens when they're broken down? What actually is produced? Well, harmless oligomers are produced. That's what actually happens. In the early studies, 2,4-TDA was found in small quantities in the urine of some patients who had had polyurethane foam implants. But it was never found in their blood. And it turned out that the reason for this was that in the preparation of the urine of those patients, they were exposed to six times normal hydrochloric acid, something that obviously doesn't happen in vivo. And what that hydrochloric acid did was it broke off 2 to 4 TDA from the harmless molecules that are produced as a result of the breakdown of polyurethane foam. So that's why it was never found in the blood, but it was found in the urine of these patients whose urine had been exposed to very strong concentrations of hydrochloric acid. When this was realized, an FDA-sponsored study was done to try and determine the truth of this. And this showed that, in fact, in vivo, no significant quantities of 2,4-TDA are actually produced. So, in summary, first of all, 2,4-TDA is not produced in human beings in vivo who have polyurethane foam-covered breast implants. And in any event, 2,4-TDA doesn't cause cancer in humans. So, it was all a furphy. Of course, we have many hundreds of thousands of women who have had polyurethane foam implants out there in the community for decades, and there has been no increase in cancer in that group. Entirely consistent with what we now know to be the real science. So we can be absolutely certain that there is no carcinogenic effect from polyurethane foam breast implants. Another criticism of polyurethane foam implants was that uh, they would have higher infection rates. In fact, that turned out not to be true. Handel's paper in PRS in 2006 and Vasquez's paper uh, reviewing 18 years history of using Silomed implants showed that there was in fact no increase in infections and no increase in late infections either. The evidence shows that with late infections most will settle with simply removal of the implant but because there is foreign body material in the capsule you may need to do a capsulectomy as well in the rare occasions when that happens. It is important to understand, though, that if you do get an infection with a polyurethane foam implant, and as I say, it's no more common than with any other implant, remove the implant early, because the earlier you remove it, the less polyurethane foam will be incorporated in the capsule, and the less capsule will need to be removed. Another criticism that I often hear is, oh yes, these are good implants, but once you put them in, you'll never get them out. It's really difficult to remove them. Well, this is not the case. This uh, criticism is often made by people who've never actually tried to do it, and they've heard that and repeated it, and it's simply not true. I have removed polyurethane foam implants for various reasons, from as short a period of time as one day to as long a period of time as 16 years. And in most cases, it is a simple, straightforward pr procedure. Here is a video in real time of me removing a polyurethane foam implant, which had been in for two years, and the total removal time is 33 seconds. Sure, on some occasions it's more difficult than that, but on some occasions it's more difficult with uh, textured implants. Sometimes you'll need to use needle point diathermy to separate the capsule from the implant surface. But uh, I've never had a case where I wished I'd not used a polyurethane foam implant because it needed to be removed. It's simply not a major concern. We've included in the menu of the DVD full-length real-time videos of slightly more difficult removal of polyurethane foam implants. There's been a concern that these kind of implants might cause an increase in seromas, but uh, Vasquez's paper, published in Aesthetic Plastic Surgery in 2007, with an 18-year history of using Silomed's polyurethane foam implants, showed that in fact there was no increase in seromas compared with other implants. What about ruptures? Silomed's polyurethane foam-covered implants are filled with gel that's sourced from applied silicone. This is a different company to the source company that most other implant companies use. And the gel that Silomed uses is both soft and cohesive. And this is a very nice combination. 
Uh, it's important to understand the difference, I think, between cohesiveness and hardness. We mustn't uh, think that those two are the same thing. They're not. If you think about um, a wine glass, for example, a wine glass is very form-stable, very hard, but it isn't very cohesive. If you drop it on the floor, it shatters into many, many pieces. If we think about a piece of chewing gum, if we take that out of our mouths, it's less form-stable than the wine glass, though still fairly form-stable. It's certainly softer. And if we throw that on the ground, it will remain together because it is fundamentally cohesive. So hardness and cohesivity are different things. And Silamed seems to have a very nice combination of softness of gel, which is obviously desirable for aesthetic purposes, and cohesivity. Here is a video of uh, removal of a leaking Silamed polyurethane foam covered implant, which had been in for about two and a half years. The patient had uh, experienced uh, a very severe blunt trauma injury. And we can see that the capsule is completely shattered. Uh, and this had occurred at least two months previously. The gel, however, is behaving in an extremely cohesive manner. It's sticking together exactly as it should, even with the complete surface capsule of the implant being ruptured. The other thing, of course, to note again is that there is no difficulty of removing that uh, capsule of the polyurethane foam implant from the patient. What about late contractures? People say, well, the polyurethane foam is going to be broken down over many years, and when it's all gone, then uh, you'll be back to square one, and there'll be a huge spike in late contractures. Well, the Vasquez paper in Aesthetic Plastic Surgery published in 2007 shows that this is in fact not the case. He had 18 years experience in more than 1,200 patients using mainly Silamed implants. He had a follow-up of 300 randomized patients, and each one of those had an annual ultrasound and mammography. Dr. Vasquez followed up 300 of those patients at five years. He still had 250 to follow up by 10 years and 180 at 15 years. So this was really very high quality data. And this showed that in fact, the capsule contracture rate was still only 1% at 15 years. Rippling. People have thought because it's a very textured